Funding for Indiana Weekend is provided by Midas and Fine Line Construction. This is Indiana Weekend, some of the most interesting people and places from around our region. These are the stories you won't always see on the regular news, voices you won't always hear elsewhere. I'm John Strauss. This is a kind of news magazine show with stories just a bit off the beaten path. Today, in the spirit of the Indiana Bicentennial, a Hoosier history lesson of sorts, a chance to sample some of our state's heritage. There's so many places that we could begin, but for this show, we wanted to start out in the historic river town of Madison. Lots of places claim the label of historic, but this whole area, a classic river town formed seven years before Indiana became a state, was designated a National Historic District in 2006. History isn't just appreciated here, it's preserved, in one case to the tune of a multi-million dollar fundraising drive to save the historic Shrewsbury home. John Stacer is president and executive director of Historic Madison, Inc. Madison is nothing if it's not history. It's one of the great historic communities in all the United States. And I sort of liken it to Savannah and Charleston in terms of its national significance. We've got the largest National Historic Landmark District that's contiguous in the United States, about 133 blocks of historic properties, with about 1,600 of those uh, historic properties contributing to our National Historic Landmark District. The Ohio River was the 19th century equivalent of a massive interstate highway, bringing people and trade to the area. The state of Indiana started along the Ohio River, okay? That, the Ohio River was the main artery of transportation. And so here in Madison, which was founded in 1809, seven years before we became a state, there was already plenty of, of uh, commercial activity going on by the time the state was founded. So really the roots of, of the state start down here on the Ohio River and then extend northward. There's also a focus on arts and culture here. The Indiana Arts Commission last year named Madison an Indiana Cultural District, along with such communities as Bloomington and Nashville. And like those places, people seem to be drawn here. We have people who come from all over the country, fall in love with it, buy property here and move here. It happens all the time and it's really fabulous because those people moving in uh, provide a lot of energy and enthusiasm uh, to the folks here and kind of help help the, the scene kind of just grow and, and change and improve. The historic architecture is part of the attraction. There's a lot of rehab work going on, bringing new life to old buildings, new uses for historic structures. People are gravitating to communities like that all across the country. As a matter of fact, new communities based upon these old urban uh, landscapes and designs are being built now and cost tons of money to get into. We've got the original stuff right here in Madison and it's reasonably priced for people to afford and live in. And it's an easy place to live if walkability, small town charm and beautiful parks count for anything. Nathan Montoya was charmed by the place when he visited and up and moved here eight years ago. Thinking of a business he could start, he decided to open this independent bookstore, Village Lights. He and his wife, Ann Vestudo, had lived in Europe and New York City and found something familiar here, a walkable community. We had that feeling here. It's walkable, it's compact, and there's a sense of history. There's a sense of how far back this goes. A sense of grandeur and a sense of beauty that has not been demolished. It's not been bulldozed, it's not been flattened, it's not been replaced with ugly, brutalist architecture or glass and steel or concrete. It, it, it's been here and you have a sense of place and a sense of time. And you have the natural beauty around it. We're in a bowl here, we're surrounded by a bluff. And the historic city is down below that bluff so we can look up and see trees all around us. We look down and you see the river. And on the other side of the river, more trees. So it's, it's quite beautiful. And conveniently located away from, but near enough, some major cities. It's well located. Uh, Cincinnati, Louisville, Indianapolis, Bloomington, Lexington as well. Uh, proximity to those, being rather central to those, uh, we enjoy visitation from people from those communities 
every weekend. There are people coming here discovering it. It's remarkable to, to hear what people say when they come into the store. I, this is just, this is amazing. Didn't know this town was here. We're sort of an, an undiscovered treasure in southern Indiana. People just, uh, we're off the beaten track. There's no interstate anywhere near us. We have a nice new bridge to Kentucky, and that helps, uh, but people just often just stumble in. The charm of a 19th century river town survived here, even as more modern development took place just outside of town. So uh, things sort of spread up to what was North Madison. It's now part of Madison on the hilltop up on the bluff. So all of the spread, the strip malls and everything, the fast food, that developed up there. People wanted to be with the times and modern. They moved up to the hill. What they didn't do was destroy the downtown because they were expanding up there. So you didn't have bulldozers coming in and taking out things down here. They were building new things up there. So a town survived. The classic downtown, grand homes, Lanier Mansion, a pre-Civil War masterpiece of Greek revival style, open to the public. The nearby Shrewsbury Wendell House, overlooking the river, being restored by historic Madison. History kept alive in a community that keeps attracting not only new visitors, but people who grew up here, went off, and are now coming back. That's the story of Melissa Lee Miller, who recently opened a boutique on Main Street with her mother, Cookie, and her husband, Todd. So I moved to Indianapolis in 1991 um, and worked in the financial industry and also the retail industry and I was there for about six years. I lived in Speedway, Indiana and then I moved back to Madison um, shortly before 9-11. We bought this building in 2011, the first building here, and what we've done is we've gone in and we've um, created a storefront uh, is, which is a retail opportunity and we've also um, updated our apartment. Uh, we have a two-level um, New York-style loft apartment, and we've also added a one-bedroom apartment, a two-bedroom apartment, and an efficiency. In any town, Main Street's always been a good place to see what people are thinking. Especially having this shop, I've met a lot of people, and they will just will get to talking and they'll say, well, yes, I'm from California, or I'm from Ohio, or I'm from New York, and I brought a place in had it for 10 years and we just come down here and uh, vacation. But I think also Madison has a lot of events. And so when they come to the regatta or they come to Riverfest or they come for uh, the home tour, then they fall in love with Madison. And then for you know it, you're, you're moving here. It's a safe little town and it makes you feel like family. People here, natives and newcomers alike, talk about the small town feel of the place. Everyone knows everybody and we truly are a community here. My mom worked at IKE for 37 years, which is a, the power plant. And so you, we truly do know everybody and everyone is so friendly and so welcoming. One of the things that I find the most amazing about Madison downtown is how many people know about us that don't live here. In all my travels abroad and everywhere that I've been, someone always knows Madison and recognizes how beautiful of a town we have. So we must have a great thing going here because definitely we're well known. If you haven't been to Madison by now, you may be thinking it's about time you made a visit. In fact, there's some terrific places to go all around Indiana, any year, but especially in this bicentennial year, when we're thinking about the state's history and the role of Indiana in national affairs. Those are some of the themes touched on in this book, Road Trip, A Pocket History of Indiana by Andrea Neal. I would say it was 2013, I got the idea to do a column on Indiana history for the bicentennial. And that uh, the column would lead up really over the course of several years educating Hoosiers about our past. I just picked what I thought were the top 100 events, figures, places in Indiana history. With one caveat, they had to have a destination attached because I wanted Hoosiers to be able to go and live and see and breathe the spot where Hoosier history happened. The book is a compilation of those articles with an emphasis on places people can actually go to see history. For example, the last ice age flattened northern Indiana, but left the southern part carved with rolling hills and deep ravines. Signs of that today include Devil's Backbone near Shades State Park. 
Boy, that's almost scary. Uh, there's some sheer drop off on either side. This is right next to Shades State Park. And you can take a heck of a hike. It's a couple miles and you can see what I would call cliffs. Yes, we have cliffs in Indiana. You can see water uh, because two, two creeks uh, converge there. And uh, you can stand in a rather harrowing spot and look down. Indiana history mirrors American history. For every important story in U.S. history, there's an Indiana story that matches up. The American Revolution, George Rogers Clark, and the George Rogers Clark Memorial would be one example. And what many Hoosiers don't understand is how instrumental he was in securing what would then have been the West for what was to be our new country and uh, pushing out the British. Then came the War of 1812. You don't want to miss the Tippecanoe battlefield uh, near, near Lafayette, where Tecumseh's forces were defeated by General William Henry Harrison. Tecumseh wasn't there at the time. His brother, the Prophet, was. Tecumseh was down south recruiting Indians for his Confederacy. William Henry Harrison knew this, and he picked that moment. And that really was considered, one, the end to the Indian presence in Indiana, but two, it was the precursor to the War of 1812, when the United States uh, said goodbye to the British uh, for, for good, and so, so I would go there. William Henry Harrison later moved to Ohio and went on to become the ninth U.S. president. Though he contracted pneumonia after a long speech in the cold on Inauguration Day and only lived a month after that, his grandson, Benjamin Harrison, was a Union colonel in the Civil War, became a prominent Indianapolis attorney, and was elected the only president from Indiana. He was a second choice of most of the delegates that year to the convention. He was a compromise candidate at what you might call a brokered or contested convention, and uh, nobody objected to him. That's how he, be he became president, really. He was a pioneer. He advocated African-American rights. He advocated conservation. He set aside hundreds of thousands of acres of forest land in the western part of the country. He appointed Frederick Douglass, the first African-American to be ambassador to Haiti. He signed the Sherman Antitrust Act into law. For a one-term president, he actually was quite accomplished. He was not a stodgy old Republican as we think of, but he was actually a very progressive intellectual Republican who was beholden to no one. Republican leaders didn't like him that much. And uh, he did what he thought was right. He was a decent, honest man, and all Hoosiers should know more about him. In southern Indiana, just 25 miles from Louisville, was the first state capital, Corydon. It's the birthplace of the state and its constitution, but was never intended to be the permanent capital. It was more convenient than uh, Vincennes, and many of the political leaders of the time were, were down there. They uh, intended it just as a temporary spot until a committee was able to go on an expedition to find the perfect spot. And, uh, and of course, it was they chose Indianapolis because one, it was almost dead center geographically, but also there was a confluence of Fall Creek and White River, and they thought it might be convenient for, for uh, water travel. You can go and see the first state capitol. You should. You should also take a little drive, and you can see the remnants of the elm tree under which the framers wrote that constitution. As the story goes, it was so blasted hot in uh, uh, the room they were, they were meeting that they decided to go outside. Unfortunately, the best effort did not preserve the tree itself. The best they could do was, was sort of embalm a big piece of the trunk. And, and it's fun to see it, and it's on the sides, it's, it's on the location where the where this uh, elm tree stood, and there's a little exhibit that you can see and you could read an inscription. Neil grew up in the state, but traveling to all these sites gave her an appreciation for these people and places she had never had before. It never failed. I would go visit some little place and I would walk away saying, now that's Indiana's best kept secret. Delphi, I'd never been there, where they have this wonderful museum that remembers the canal era in Indiana, and when during the summer you can take a canal boat ride on a stretch of restored Wabash Erie Canal, everyone should go there. I'd actually never been to the Studebaker Museum in South Bend. That is one of the best museums I've ever visited. I never got car buffs. Who are these guys who collect 
old cars and keep them in their garages and spend thousands of dollars on it. After going to that museum, I understood those are works of art. Another comparable museum, the Auburn Core Duesenberg Museum. Again, I saw so many cars, I, I combined those two trips. So, I'm on, so many cars, my mind was reeling, but you can really learn a lot about Hoosier's love affair with the cars by going there. I recommend not only going to those two museums, but maybe stopping at a drive-in. You can go to Greenwood, Indiana, to the Suds. It is one of the oldest surviving drive-ins from the drive-in era of the 1950s. Uh, you've got an old station wagon on the, on the book cover, the idea being, we love our cars, let's jump in our cars this summer and drive around the state and see what there is. She has the zeal of somebody who's discovered or rediscovered dozens of interesting places talking about them with the kind of affection you hear from people recalling their favorite spots to visit. But this history teacher also came away with a firm conviction. We ought to know more about our history, and maybe these road trips could help us discover it. I hope that one of the legacies of the Bicentennial is a realization that we must teach Indiana history. It is so important. It makes us value our state so much more. There is a, a sense that Hoosiers are ashamed of themselves or of elements of their history. I get that sense from people who don't know anything about Indiana history. We need to claim our history. Yes, we have warts. The Klan era is a wart. There have been officials like D.C. Stevenson, whom, uh, of whom we're not proud. And uh, we have to know our history warts and all. That makes us appreciate it, for sure. There was the time that Hoosiers attacked Frederick Douglass when he was on his abolitionist speaking tour in the northern part of the state. But, but we have to know both the good and the bad of our history and we have to claim it, but we need to know that these, we have some of the most significant personalities in American history and recognized uh, literary giants, uh, people more recently like Kurt Vonnegut, but Meredith Nicholson and Booth Tarkington, and we need to know these people and claim them and, and understand that our Hoosier identity is so rich. You know, there are many Indiana communities with a claim to fame of some kind. Here in Peru, they have two. This is the home of legendary songwriter Cole Porter, and they celebrate that with a festival each year. It's also the home of the Peru Amateur Youth Circus. Each July, about 200 teenagers and even younger kids put on a real three-ring circus, including the flying trapeze. We visited one night as they practiced. Swinging 40 feet in the air, a young woman hoping to be caught in time by her partner on another swing. The timing's not always right, but that's what practice is for. Three, four, five. Other young performers are juggling, working on the balance board, twirling on ropes. They start at an early age. Brooke Baker is 13 and has been doing this for seven years. But I've been doing Spanish web for uh, two years now. Um, it's really hard because there's, we have to do fast spin and you have to hold on and it's with one arm so it's a lot harder. And it depends how fast they spin you, so if they spin you too fast, you have to be not afraid to let go. A lot of kids get out of it is hard work, um, learning how to do stuff, um, working together because it's some, a lot of the tricks that, and a lot of the acts that we have to do, you have to work together. My favorite part is making sure that everybody gets a good show and everybody smiles and it's just fun to smile back at everybody and know that they're watching you and they came here to show you so you have to put on a good show for them because they paid good money and they'd like to see a good show. One man who's seen a lot of this is Bruce Embry, who's been a ringmaster with the circus for 36 years and has seen what learning these skills, practicing and performing them can do for young people. It is intimidating, but it's amazing how quickly people learn. We train them on a wire that's a foot and a half off the floor. And then they go onto a wire that's a little higher than that. And then the big test is, can they go up high? Some can, some can't. Some don't get over the fear of the height. Others can do it as easily up there as they do close to the ground. They learn trust, they learn teamwork. They have to have the skills to do it. It's just a great learning experience for them. And you talk about a bonding experience. Peru calls itself the Circus City. A traveling show formed here in the late 1800s, circus performers would retire here. We had a number of, of circus performers who were either from here or came back and retired. Emmett Kelly was from Peru. And some of his family members continued to live here. Over the last 
well, is, is uh, Pat Kelly. One of his sons is still clowning at the Circus Hall of Fame. Uh, Dorothy Kelly and her son Ed both passed away just a couple of years ago. That ended that, that side of the family. The Hygienis, who were the original trainers, Tom and Betty Hygieni, had been bareback performers with the Hygieni family. They retired here and then were asked to train. Willie Wilno, who was one of the original trainers, was a retired human cannonball who had settled here. So we, we trace our roots to that period of time when professional performers who had retired here actually did the training. And that now has evolved into former performers doing the training. The Circus City Festival and the Amateur Youth Circus began in 1960 with retired performers teaching the students. Bill Anderson, the head trainer, and I have laughed a lot over the years about how we fool kids into thinking they're learning circus, when actually what they're learning is life skills. They're learning to take risks, they're learning to stretch themselves, to do things that they didn't think they could do. And there's a, it is a great learning experience for them. Some of them, you see the light come on, some of them finally recognize that and realize that circus has done a lot more for them than just teach them acts. They start practicing every year in March. It feels like the whole town is behind this. There's even a hundred piece circus band that performs regularly, including on this night at a retirement center. Sandy Ploss is a volunteer with the festival and a former child performer herself. These kids are so dedicated and you just have to be, you know, because you've got to build not only your own skills, but if you're in an act with someone else, you've got to build that trust with that other person. You've got to build that great rapport with our trainers and we're so proud of our trainers. We have 13 trainers this year, all of whom learned their skills right at home right here in, in Peru. Um, some of them have gone on to perform professionally and we're very fortunate that they're back now helping to train the kids now. She came from a circus family so it was just natural that she started performing before she could even drive. I did perform myself. I did uh, was the very first on the side-by-side -side trapeze, which is a little boy and girl act. And um, we did that back, um, I won't tell you how long ago, but we were in the tent then, if that tells you anything. Um, and I got to train with Willie Wilno, who was the human cannonball with Hagenbach Wallace and performed with my grandfather. So um, that was very, very honored to be able to be chosen for that act because it was just the little boy and I, uh, my partner Jerry Woolley and I that did that. And then later on, oh my gosh, I've done played with the band. Um, um, I sung the national anthem for all of the shows. Um, I walked on a rolling globe. Um, you know, I did a lot of things. And so, you know, I volunteered my time once I aged out. And so I was on the board for a while. Um, I was able to take care of tickets. I helped produce the parade. I helped produce the show, which is huge. Um, and now I'm just content to be their secretary. 19-year-old Alana Lease hoisting another girl onto her shoulders on this balance board has been with the circus for 11 years. I got started, I was a kitty clown my first year when I was six years old, and then when I was seven I became a performer. And I started doing basic acts, balancing bike, swinging ladders, things basic for around here anyway. And then I got into high wire, and that became my niche. I ride unicycles on the high wire, I juggle on the high wire, that's my thing. A couple years ago, we had to do a high wire trick. We had a unicycle pyramid. Two unicycles, me in the front on a unicycle and a girl in the back on a unicycle. And in the middle, a girl did a headstand. And we had to do it 22 feet in the air. And I was terrified. None of us had safeties, but I knew that we could do it. And I was nervous and shaky, but I heard people going yelling in the audience and I knew we could do it and we nailed it. I love it. It's my life. This is my family down here. It's everything. I have formed bonds down here with people that I, have, I can't compare any other bonds to. When someone else is holding your life in their hands, it becomes a different story. You become so close to them, you trust them, and it's crazy, it's awesome. This is about more than kids putting on a show. Embry says there's a lesson here for other communities, even a public policy lesson. 
The lesson is, give kids a chance and they can do anything. The kids who walk the high wire in Peru, Indiana would not know they had that talent if we didn't have this show. But not everyone can have it because they don't have the background in it. But you can have a swimming pool in your school where kids can find out whether they have the talent to be a swimmer. And they don't have to be uh, an Olympic gold medalist just to learn to do it. It changes your life if you have something you can do uh, that, that you're good at. And I think we, we as, as we have worried more and more about our tax money, we've cut pools out of schools. We've cut strings programs out of schools. We've cut a lot of things that really give kids some identity. And we need, to, we need to be concerned about that. We need to continue to provide those things so children can find things they enjoy doing that they're good at, that fulfill them, that help them identify themselves. And that's the message of circus. To check out even a short list of the fascinating places around the state, feels like you could probably go someplace interesting nearly every day. And that's the point of the book, Road Trip, A Pocket History of Indiana. The idea that history somehow needs to be experienced, even if it just means standing where they stood. That connection between the places and the spirit of the people is what you sense when you connect with history this way. Sometimes, all we need is an excuse to get started. I'm John Strauss. That's our show for today. Thanks so much for being with us. Hope you'll join us next time when we go out to find more stories off the beaten path from around Indiana on Indiana Weekend. Funding for Indiana Weekend is provided by Midas and Fine Line Construction.